As a media watcher, Africa is one of the most fascinating and confounding continents uh, you can ever encounter. And if you ever thought that you knew what was going on, the next incident will sort of uh, drive you insane and make you wonder what it is you knew after all. Um, across the elections that happened on the continent, 12 or 13 of them this year, if you count Sierra later on, um, for me there were things that, to, uh, that stood out. The big narrative was one, there was change in a big way that was driven by people power and in that I would put Nigeria and Burkina Faso in that category. There was also, whether it's by expedience or whether it's a sign of a maturing electorate, there was also an acceptance and a rewarding of competence. And I think I'll put Tanzania and Ivory Coast in that category. You can agree, uh, disagree or agree with me. But we also uh, saw the start of a very worrying trend, which um, I think will continue in 2016, and that was the somewhat unimaginative consolidation of power and the very oppressive political environment and, and the very dreaded third term uh, agenda that seems to have went away a little bit but has come back, uh, up again. And in that I'll put you know, Burundi, Sudan, Togo, uh, Ethiopia, to name a few in that category. Um, talking about the role of the media in, in these democratic processes or in uh, trying to hold political uh, actors to account, I would say that in this election season, to a large extent, the media on the continent was playing catch up with, with people, with innovation and the real sentiments on the ground. And where the media was effective, you saw that there was a very concerted effort to shut them down. So you had in Sudan, for instance, the closure of the Tribune. You had, there was one occasion on a day where the print run of 10 different newspapers seized by state actors. You had journalists harassed. In Burundi, there was a lot of uh, attacks on radio stations. Some of them were torched, harassment of journalists. Some were driven out of the country. And um, I suppose that's not new in the African context because the relationship between the government and the media have always been uh, uh, antagonistic, to say the least. Is it changing? I don't think it's changing in any way, not uh, you know, by uh, what we've seen in these uh, recent elections. But then you think about Ethiopia, for instance, which is notorious for not accepting dissent. They uh, had the, uh, the uh, Zone 9 bloggers in jail facing death sentences who were released uh, sort of to coincide with Obama's, uh, Obama's visit. They were released after the elections had happened, but they currently remain free and we're not sure what the government will do next in its sort of relationship with the media or the press. I suppose um, the action currently going on in Oromia will give us a sense of how they're going to respond to any criticism because that's the sort of uh, trigger that would um, that will show uh, what kind of thinking the Ethiopian comes with. Um, you have a situation where it's in South Sudan, for instance, where uh, they've had a civil war for the uh, last two years. Many respected journalists who survived the war have been forced out of the profession. Alfred Taban and several others had to publicly announce that they were retiring from being journalists because of the harassment and the criticism that they'd faced and their lives were put in danger. So in terms of the media's role in either policing elections or in, um, in checking political, polit politicians, I think that people power, as I mentioned earlier, has been more effective as a medium because they have been able to inform and debate political opinion on platforms that they can control. And that's where social media comes in. WhatsApp has been an amazing tool that has been used by the people on the continent in the last couple of years. It's transformed from being a social tool to becoming a mo mobilizing platform. And to some extent, it's become a pseudo broadcast medium because you can share video, you can share audio. And because of the encryption on WhatsApp, it's uh, much less uh, easier to censor. And so people share with families because they've got uh, that access and that close community on there. And it's uh, much more difficult to monitor by the government. And so it's made, it's put the power of communication into people's hands. And the reason why it's important is because um, the media on the continent 
it's acceptably diversified, but in that diversification, there's a plurality of voices, but to some extent, that voice is also consolidating. And the reason uh, that's happening is that um, the big media players, for sensible business reasons, are consolidating property on the continent. So they're buying up, you know, within countries or across borders, they're buying up radio stations and television stations because it's much more financially prudent to have a stable of media uh, 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 operations than to have one radio station if you're competing for advertising revenue and uh, those sort of things. But what it means is that a lot of these conglomerates are uh, often owned by big political players. And so there's a narrowing of the space for any alternative voices to be heard. And so if you're operating a one-man band operation, uh, where in 10 years ago you'd have been successful, now you can't be because you're competing with very big players with a lot of money behind them. And so that's narrowing the space for voices to be heard. Uh, I'll give Tanzania as an example, and that's something that we observed playing out in Tanzania, where a major media player privately owned, uh, was able to use their resources to support the ruling CCM party, which at that time was very in um, disarray, actually. And it was uh, there was a danger that the party was falling apart uh, for a few months uh, during part of their infighting. But to some extent, I think that that development in Tanzania is more dangerous because you can say that where the state media operates, it's by their nature, by their nature, their obligation to provide equal access to all the political voices and all the platforms that are available, so that they create a, 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 a much more even platform for people to debate uh, issues. But where you have a private player in the market, how do you compel that business to be able to provide the same level playing field for all political voices and all political opinion to be aired? And some would say that it's the media regulator's job to do that, but <coughs> it's a very difficult job for them to do in many parts of the continent. Um, in Sudan, for instance, um, you have close to 30 publications, almost 28 of them, are owned by either the state or surrogates of the state. So you have, even in those circumstances, very close uh, space. If you look at Nigeria, for instance, which is one of the most vibrant and most dynamic uh, places for uh, debate and, and, and uh, conversation, one of the driving forces around the change agenda in, in Nigeria that allowed uh, General Buhari, apart from their own political uh, ground game, which was supreme in a lot of ways, to, to win the elections, was because of um, the diversity of opinion that had been built up through social media, the Enough is Enough campaign, from the fuel protest a few years ago. And that coalesced into a very active um, voice, particularly uh, spearheaded by the middle classes. And you'd compare that to Kenya, where the Kenyans on Twitter are the driving force be, uh, behind checking and balancing the state currently in the country, much more than the, uh, the established media have been. In Nigeria, there was a reason why somebody recently proposed a bill to, uh, in the Senate to uh, punish anyone who would, in their words, propagate false information on electronic media. And this was because you could use the laws, you could use financial punishment to successfully stifle the ambition of any media house that will look to uh, holding officials to account. Um, on social media, there's very there's less chance of being successful in doing that. So that's why there's a row about free speech and the responsibility around free speech still brewing in Nigeria. Um, I want to talk about my country, Ghana. So I've sort of jumped around and picked on different themes, but one of the things that Nick talked about is some of the successes with uh, consolidating democracy, and you see that represented in how the media is also able to confidently take on state actors and take on the, uh, uh, the, the structures of state and be able to hold them to account. So one of the biggest stories we've been uh, following this year in Ghana uh, came from the, an undercover investigation, I don't know if many of you are aware of this, an undercover investigation done by a journalist called Anas Arameo Anas. And um, it was into um, looking at corruption in the judiciary. So um, for two years, he went undercover as a lawyer. He's a trained uh, lawyer himself. 
but he managed to get a job uh, as a lawyer, so it gave him access to the court system. And for two years, he was dealing with judges, judicial workers, magistrates. And in that period, he had 500 hours of recording of judges, magistrates, judicial workers asking for either money. Some were asking for sex for uh, to be able to change the course of uh, cases. Uh, and um, after he released his report, 180 judicial workers, high court judges, magistrates were formally investigated by the Judicial Service uh, and the Attorney General in Ghana. So far, 20 judges have been sacked. Uh, there are a few more, uh, 12 high court judges are still being investigated. And probably by the time the process is done, uh, there'll be about 100 plus judicial workers, judges and magistrates who will be out of a job, pensions and um, because of the work done by ANAS. Now, for many Ghanaians, um, the judiciary is an institution that we hold to heart. And it's because of a very difficult incident that happened in 1982. 82, when three judges and a former military officer was killed, were killed in mysterious circumstances. So a lot of Ghanaians swore, and I was quite young at that time, but felt that they needed to protect the judici judiciary at all costs from the uh, machinations of politicians. So for this to have been revealed was a big uh, break in trust for a lot of Ghanaians, and a lot of people were hurt by that. Um, and so for them, you know, the evidence of this judicial corruption was for a lot of Ghanaians uh, heartbreaking, but it was Anas doing his job, holding the elite to account. But I've also heard arguments that um, what Anas was doing was he was getting rid of some of the gatekeepers for some of the other elite, and these are the political elites. Um, Anas will say that what he was doing was a job in the service of the people of Ghana in his role as the guardian of the people uh, who have entrusted uh, the fourth estate to do this role. For me as a journalist, I think it was one of the best examples of what a journalist's role should be in Africa today. He was working, operating in an environment where there were institutions of state that were stable even though there was corruption in those institutions, he was protected under the law to be able to interrogate the uh, efficiency of those institutions. He was protected by the Attorney General who gave him immunity from all prosecution because of his activity to expose the wider corruption because it was seen to be in the interest of the public. Um, so that's what happens when you have strong institutions in a country which can hold people to account, but also show to the general public that these institutions are not untouchable. Because for a long time, uh, certainly in the African context, if you're in parliament, if you're in the judiciary, if you're in politics, you're untouchable. And the little people will always feel that they're marginalized. The little people will always feel that they can never have a voice. And if you begin to create an environment where the people you govern feel they no longer have a voice, either politically or institutionally, you're creating an environment uh, and ensuring up trouble for yourself for the future. Now, um, I want to uh, end by posing a dilemma and something that I myself have um, trouble figuring out. And it goes back to what the role of the media on the continent is and should be. Uh, we know that in many parts of Africa, and, you know, as Nick and both Professor Lipumba have uh, mentioned, more often than not, elections and the electoral process and democracy is an all or nothing affair. And um, when it really shouldn't be, but our reality is that because of history, because of personality, because of interest, because of illiteracy, lots of factors, that's what happens on the continent. Um, and as the media, we have to, I think, interrogate our role, uh, uh, playing a watchdog role for democracy. Uh, and it, I think in, in Africa, it means that we have to also protect that democracy, whatever form it takes. Um, but the question is, how do we do that? Somehow I think that um, our default cynicism as media people doesn't help us in that role of protecting democracy. 
Um, let me use the example of uh, Magufuli in Tanzania uh, and to some extent Buhari in Nigeria uh, as an example. So Buhari run his government after winning the elections for about four months, close to four months, without any ministers. And um, because he said he wanted to create a new culture of accountability and to uh, establish mm -hmm. A, a new way of working, or also he wanted to have time to find the right people to be able to deliver a corruption-free administration, as he had promised in his election campaign. Um, invariably, the response to that action was very mixed. Uh, you know, his opponents were quick to say that you know Buhari was harking back to his military dictator days and wanting to do everything for himself. His praise singer said, look at our Superman, and you know, he is running things on his own, and he's the brainiest person that ever lived. Um, but as media, did we use the opportunity to raise questions about whether the governance principles that we set out was efficient, as exposed by Buhari? Magufuli is doing a brilliant job in Tanzania, as has been um, uh, mentioned by a lot of observers. He's establishing an example of his principles. But how long will it take before we hear complaints about how he's been dictatorial by wanting to know what's going on in every ministry under his purview? And as somebody who rep works for, represents an international media, um, should the role of international media be the same as local media in observing and reporting on democratic processes. My argument, personal argument, is that there is more at stake for local media than there is for international media. And my personal opinion uh, is that for local media, and I speak as somebody who used to work quite a lot in local media in Ghana, and that's how I started, is that our role, our primary role, should be as educators, and I'll expand that, and I think that I say that because I think we have a responsibility to our people to explain the world to them and to do that impartially. And I think we have to do that by explaining who the actors of state are and doing that impartially without fear of favor and being to share the good and the bad and the ugly about those people. I think we it's our role to ensure that people understand what they're meant to be delivering for them so that we explain to our electorate that the parliamentary candidate should not be standing on a platform saying, I'll build you a road because that's not his job. The parliamentarian's job is to enact laws that allows your country to run. It's the local government that's meant to build roads. Do we do that? Do we explain how the state is supposed to work, how governance is supposed to work to the people, and so that the expectations of people to those actors of state would be realistic? Because lots of MPs will say that after winning a vote, they run out of money because they have to pay school fees, they have to pay for funeral expenses, they're held to a lot of you know, expectations because of the promises they made on a campaign trail. Are we building false expectations? And what's the media role in educating people into knowing what is right? <coughs> Our role is to interrogate them uh, when they fail at that task and to showcase what they are doing right. And I think that our job is to be a watchdog of the state and a system that is set up collectively and signed up to under the Constitution that it is working as it should, and that people raise questions about how the society transitions, whether it's about questioning uh, outmoded traditional practices, points in law that are no longer consistent with the current uh, way of life, reflecting society to itself. And so, uh, well, maybe not everybody will agree with me on this, but that's how I see the media's role. Uh, and I think that introspection is very good for any community. International media, I think, should be observers of the society and explaining that society to the rest of the world. But to some extent, my observation is that 
as African media, and I put myself in the local context, we have allowed international media to perform the first function, observing and reflecting society and questioning that society, rather than being, uh, we're, we're more active than we should be in telling individual stories to the people uh, themselves, rather than being observers of the local community <coughs> telling the stories to each other. And I think it's an outrageous indictment on African media practitioners and African media that we've allowed that environment to happen because no international media, no observer is able to tell your story better than yourself. They won't understand the nuance. They won't understand the factors that lead to certain actions. They won't interpret um, the history as well as uh, you could. And so the, I think the uh, responsibility goes back to local media on the continent. But are we creating the space? Are we offering the training? Are we um, encouraging the, the local media, people like Alas, to do the job that they'd like to do, which is support the democratization and the growth of their societies?